Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. You know, this is one of the favorite programs for people, our viewers, and we're so glad you like it because it gives us the privilege of studying to share with you. We are journeying through the Gospel of Mark, and Lesson 10, today's lesson, is the last days. Now, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists, but if you would like to get their individual notes, which will differ from the quarterly, don't go to, don't go to the website. Email us at SSP for Sabbath School Panel, SSP at 3ABN.org. You can email once and sign up for this and you will get lessons every week in your email account. So now let me introduce my brothers and sisters. Well, actually, it's all brothers mm. today. <laughs> let me introduce nice my brothers in Christ, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Monday's lesson, Not One Stone on Another, Matthew 13. Amen. Mark 13, excuse me. <laughs> We're getting there. And then Pastor Brian Day. Man, I have uh, Tuesday's lesson entitled, The Abomination of Desolation. Oh, that's a good one. And then we have Professor Daniel Perry. I've got Wednesday's lesson, The Great Tribulation. Boy, these are good lessons. <laughs> and then Pastor John Dinsey. I am blessed to have uh, Thursday's portion, The Coming of the Son of Man. Mm. Woo, these are going to be some incredible lessons. Ryan, would you like to have our opening prayer? Sure, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we give this time to you. And as always, we ask for your leadership and guidance. Give us your Holy Spirit that we may speak your word plainly, clearly, uh, with boldness, with power, so that these words and these lessons, Lord, will make sense and each and every one of us will be drawn closer to our Savior, Jesus Christ, because of it. We give this time over to you and we ask that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Our memory text for this week is Mark 13, 26 and 27. Mark 13, 26 and 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. So our focus this week is a striking prophecy about the fate of the beautiful Jerusalem temple and more. The Temple Mount was, it just dominated the city of Jerusalem and, and it was beautiful. I've been very blessed to go to Israel five different years in a row with back-to-back -to -back tours and it is astonishing to see the size of the stones that were used in this amazingly beautiful temple. This prophecy will go from Jesus' time on earth to the very end, to his second coming. And the lesson starts with a brief story that at first, as I was looking at this, I thought, oh, all of these exciting lessons on the last days and this lesson is starting with just this little short story, how Jesus makes a profound statement about a poor little widow and her small act of love. Mm. But we think it's a small act. It was a big act of sacrificial generosity. Mm -hmm. So. In the context of this story, this is going to be Sunday's story, the two little coins in the offering. Remember the context of this story. It's his last visit to the temple and the broader context. This is the Passion Week. Mm. So anything that is included, including Sunday's story, 10 little coins, two little coins in the offering, is important. Mm -hmm. So let's read it. Mark 12 verses 38 through 40. Then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes and they love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feast who devour 
widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. He's saying hypocrites, especially teachers, if someone is a teacher, they've got a greater accountability before the Lord. But if you're a hypocritical teacher, you're going to receive greater condemnation. So then in verse 41, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. He is now in the women's. It's a very spacious, open court of the women. And he is sitting opposite. There's 13 trumpet-shaped receptacles that are on the walls in this court. And they're there for offerings and the tax collection for the temple. And it says, he sat opposite the treasury and he saw how the people put money into the treasury and many who were rich put in much. So he's sitting there watching the worshipers make their contributions and one rich man after another comes up and deposits their gifts, sometimes in a pretentious way to make all the noise they could so that people could see their acts of service. And they're trying to impress others. But then it says in verse 42, Mark 12, 42, then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, two little copper coins. This was the smallest of the Roman coinage. She threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. Now, there's a bold contrast between the offerings of the rich and the offerings of this little widow. Jesus realizes this poor widow lived a hand-to-mouth existence. Mm -hmm. And when she put in those two mites, that was everything she had to live on. In other words, she didn't know where her next meal was coming from mm -hmm. until she worked and earned more money. So this wasn't much. It was less than a day's wage. But she was giving in her absolute love, her absolute devotions. You know, it makes me think of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and verse 7, where it says, God loves a cheerful giver. He loves someone who's not counting the cost of discipleship. They just can't wait to give their all. Not giving out of compulsion or obligation, but out of love. And Matthew 6, 19, verse 21, where Jesus tells us that when you give, you are storing up treasures in heaven where the rust and the moth cannot destroy. So here's what's interesting. He praises her sacrificial giving as an act of devotion and faith. Listen to this, Mark 12, 43 and 44. Jesus is excited. He calls his disciples to himself and he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury for they all put in out of their abundance but she out of her poverty put in all she had, her whole livelihood. So from the divine perspective of Jesus, this widow, what she gave was more than everything else combined. She didn't know where her next meal was coming from. You know, this is a profound lesson on the idea of wealth, on the idea of faith. And this woman's act of faith is significant. So what is Jesus doing? He's measuring heart motive. Mm -hmm. This woman had the right motive, the generosity, and this idea of self-sacrificing commitment. The rich gave out of their abundance. She gave everything she had to live on which is a true expression of devotion. So the poor widow's tiny gift was extravagant. And Jesus 
recognize this. And it serves as a timeless reminder. This is important. This is the last week. This may be the last time he's at the temple. And he is saying, look what she's done mm -hmm. in excitement. So what we have to remember is it's not always important what we give, but what we hold back. The amount we give, you know, there are some people who are quite wealthy and can make big donations that seem impressive. But what are we holding back from the Lord? The true meaning of giving encourages believers to trust in God's provision. I have a friend who, when she first came to 3ABN, it was bad circumstances. She was absolutely broke, had a little bit of money, was going to go do some grocery shopping, ran into somebody on the side of the road who had a flat tire, gave him everything she had. Mm -hmm. And God saw to it that her groceries were paid for. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So as we reflect on this passage, we are called to emulate the widow's example, giving wholeheartedly and sacrificially to God, particularly in the last days. Mm -hmm. I want to read this because I think it's important. This is a quote from the Adult Bible Study Guide. And here's what Dr. Tom Shepard has to say. Quote, this story contains a deep lesson about the management of resources. Giving to God's cause does not depend on the actions of leaders to have validity. Now listen up. The religious leadership of the temple was corrupt. Think of Caiaphas, Annas. But Jesus did not thereby affirm withholding offerings. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, I don't know if I approve what the general conference is going to do. I'm not sure I'm going to give my tithe. Jesus is showing just the opposite in this lesson. It says, if ever there were corrupt religious leaders like Caiaphas and Annas, those at this time were among the worst, and Jesus knew it too. It is true that leaders have a sacred responsibility to use resources in accordance with the will of God. But even if they do not, those who give to the cause of God are still blessed in their giving as this woman was. Withholding tithes or offerings, on the other hand, when leaders do something displeasing, means that the giving is tied to their actions instead of being made in thankfulness to God. So however tempting it might be to do, that's wrong. Amen. I really like this story, Shelley. The first time I've re recognized the connection between this story and what we're about to read in Mark 13. Uh, I'm James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, Not One Stone Upon Another. And really, what you've said there, Shelley, sets us up because it's going to take complete sacrifice, giving everything we have to make it through Mark 13. Mark 13 is one of the three chapters in the Gospels that deals with the end of time, times of signs of the times. You have Mark 13, you have Matthew 24, which is probably probably more famous than Mark 13, and then you have Luke 21. All three of those chapters kind of parallel Revelation and Daniel and talk about signs leading up to first the destruction of Jerusalem and then to the second coming of Jesus. And what it's going to take for us to be ready for the second coming of Jesus is not a partial offering of ourselves, but a full sold out offering, everything we have, giving it to Jesus. Not one stone upon another. Let's read Mark 13, 1 through 13. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read a couple verses and comment, a couple verses and comment. I think that'll be easier for us. We might not get through it all. We'll see how far we can get. As Jesus goes out from the temple after just blessing this widow and the might she gave, one of his disciples says unto him, Master, see what stones and what buildings are here, exclamation mark. Like, look at this. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great, building, these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another 
that shall not be thrown down. Now let's just pause right there for a second. We know this had an application to the first temple. Does it have a second application? You know, in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 and 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, we are described as living stones mm -hmm. of a temple that God is building. And I believe that if we look at this in a spiritual application, we want to recognize that not one of us will be able to depend on another in the very end of time. Each one of us is going to have to stand for ourselves with the Holy Spirit to give a reason for our faith. We can't say, well, the pastor told me this or, or the, the elder told me this or my, my Bible worker told me this. This is, this is what they believe. We need to be able to give a reason for our faith individually, personally, have a personal relationship with Christ. We can't depend on somebody else. Verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, I love this. I call this the Jesus huddle. In other words, they're perplexed. They're not understanding what does Jesus mean? This temple's going to be destroyed? Not one stone left upon another? The whole thing's coming down? And so they come to him privately. Friends, when you have a question about the Bible, when you're not sure what it's talking about, when you're not sure about end time prophecy, don't discard it. Don't ignore it. Don't just say, well, I, I can't understand that. I want to jump back into something that's easy. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus privately. Huddle with Jesus. Get in the huddle with Jesus because Jesus wants to have that personal, private time with you so he can tell you what's going on, so you can learn the game plan, so he can tell you what the next play is, because we need to know where are we going to position ourselves in this game of life? What, what route do we need to be running? Where do we need to, what position do we need to occupy for Christ as we prepare for the end of time? The Jesus huddle. Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them, verse 5, began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, that is, in Christ's name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So, this is the first thing Jesus warns the disciples about and us about, not only in Mark, but also in Matthew. In fact, he does it three times in Matthew. And, of course, the same warning is given in the book of Luke. Do not trust men. Do not follow men, especially Christian men. That is, pastors and leaders, uh, presidents, whoever they are, Christians or otherwise, do not trust men, Jesus is saying. Many people are going to come in my name, and they're going to deceive a lot of people because they're coming in my name. And you think, oh, they're a Christian, they're a pastor, they're a leader, I should trust them. Listen to what they say. Follow their counsel if it harmonizes with God's word, but do not follow them simply because they're in positions of leadership. Oh, uh, I talked to my pastor about the Sabbath and, and he tells me it was nailed to the cross. So the pastor must be right, I'm just gonna listen to him. Don't do it. This is the warning that Jesus is giving right here. And we're going to see how important this is as we move through the rest of this chapter and talk about the, the abomination of desolation, some of the, 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 the important aspects that Jesus wants us to understand that are going to, we're going to be misled by men if we're not following the word of God, right? So Saul became Paul, he was an early church leader, and in Acts 17, the Bereans listened to everything he had to say, but you know what they did after that? They went back to the Bible to see if it was so. We need to go to the Word of God, right? The very center verse of the entire Bible is Psalm 118, verse 8. If you go equally verses left and verses right, at least in the KJV, it says, Psalm 118 and verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And of course, we have Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. I'm not sure we're going to have time to read all of these verses, but notice what it says here. Let's just read them. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, that makes flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a heath in the desert, and he shall not see when good comes. But he will inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and in a salt land not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river. He shall not, he, and, and he shall not see when he comes, but his leaf shall be green and he shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Put your trust in the Lord. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, verse 7, And when you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled, Jesus says. For such things must need be, but the end is not yet. Nation is going to rise against nation, verse 8, and kingdom is going to rise against kingdom, and there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be uh, in diverse places, and there's going to be famines and troubles. 
all of these are the beginning of sorrows. And that word sorrows means birth pains. Birth pains that increase in intensity and frequently, frequency, both for the birth and the birthees. Those who are being birthed and, and are maturing in their Christian character to perfection. In other words, these birth pains, these, these signs, these indicators that increase the intensity and frequency help us to grow. And we're going to see as all of these signs are being fulfilled around us and intensity is increasing around us, it's a time for us to mature. It's a time for us to grow in our Christian experience. But we're all going to see, also going to see a growth in the character and nature of those who are following the devil, those who are following Satan, those who are following the prince of this world. There's going to be a maturity of two crops, those who are ready for heaven and those who are ready to be lost, totally lost. According to Revelation chapter 14, we're going to see that come to fruition just, be, just as Jesus comes. But take heed, verse 9 says, to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten. That's in the churches. Today that would be in the churches. And you'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Persecution of believers is a testimony against the persecutors. Persecution of believers is a testimony against the persecutors. Sometimes you think, oh, that's a terrible thing. These believers are being persecuted. When you look at the experience of persecution, God's people filled with the Spirit of God, with the Spirit of Christ, it's a testimony like it was with Stephen when he was stoned. It's a testimony against the persecutors. And people's eyes are opened and they see clearly the contrast between truth and error. So don't be afraid of persecution. It's a time to testify for Jesus. And this gospel must first be published among all nations. During persecution, all nations have a chance to see the gospel. Matthew 24, 14 says they get a fuller understanding of the gospel because it goes as a witness. Verse 11, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you will speak, neither do uh, you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that ye shall speak. For it is not you who's speaking, but the Holy Ghost. What do you think about that one, Ryan? Mm. No preparation for sermons, man. That's no right. notes, nothing. That's Believers right. do not prepare sermons during the time of severe persecution. They prepare themselves. You mm. do not prepare a sermon. You are the sermon coming soon to a courthouse near you. Many would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And this is going to be the time when we're going to be seeing a lot of sermons. Verse 12, now, brothers shall betray, betray brother to death and father the son. Children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. Verse 13, and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake, but he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now today, we call this cancel culture which unfortunately Christians that I know, even Adventist Christians, justify as a way of taking people out that they don't agree with. But the end game is the same. We want to eliminate certain people from society. We think we can choose that our judgment is God's judgment, yet our actions reveal the truth. Cancel culture is putting ourselves in the place of God. It is anti-Christ. It is anti-Christian in every way. How do believers endure the loss the betrayal of family and close friends? How do we endure worldwide hate and death? How do we endure cancel culture? Hebrews chapter 12 tells us it's by looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You'll want to get bitter. You'll want to eliminate people. You'll want to engage in that cancel culture. Withhold yourself from doing that. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Yes, do you be weary and faint in your mind? Let him take out every root of bitterness. Relax and trust in Jesus. He's got this. In fact, that's what he says in the Gospel of John. Let not your heart be troubles, be troubled. I've got this. And he does have this. So let him have it. Trust in him as you move into these final movements in these last day events. Ooh, thank you, Pastor James. We have got much more coming, just of equal quality as this. So please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family.
Now we will continue with Pastor Ryan Day. All right, my name is Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson, The Abomination of Desolation. We've just come off of this powerful teaching of not one stone will be left upon another. Now we're going to transition into the time in which Jesus is going to describe when that actual event takes place. So here we go, The Abomination of Desolation in less than 10 minutes. We're going to go to Mark chapter 13 and we're going to read verses 14 to 18. It says there in Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 14, so when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into his house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. And of course, that's in Matthew chapter 24, that Sabbath day aspect. But it does say here in verse 18, not in the winter. Matthew adds, or on the Sabbath day. In fact, speaking of Matthew, let's just read the first verse there of this, of this passage, which would be verse 15, speaking of the abomination of desolation. Notice just the slight wording difference. Matthew 24, verse 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. And then you kind of get the nature or, or at least a, a better look into what's actually happening with this abomination of desolation when you read verse 20 of Luke chapter 21, because Luke says, but when you shall see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. Now, I just want to highlight what did it say in Mark chapter uh, 13, verse 14? It says, so when you see the abomination of desolation, there in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, and again, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem, I just want to bring this out very clearly. The abomination of desolation is something that you can see. It is not the destruction itself, because if it was the destruction, how could you flee, right? That's the warning. So there is something which those who are inside the holy city can see and which becomes a sign for them to flee. So that's what we're looking for in identifying this. And I also want to bring about Jesus gave warnings to the Pharisees and to the, to the nation of Israel in Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 41 to 44. Notice what he says here. He says, now as he drew near, it goes on to say, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surrounding you to close you in on every side and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave you or leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This is in connection with this abomination that brings about the desolation. We have to understand that this is something Something that's going to happen in Jerusalem at this particular time. And actually, we see here very clearly that it's in connection with the Daniel the prophet. In fact, all, uh, at least both times in Matthew and also in, uh, in Mark, we see that Jesus specifically connects this to Daniel the prophet. So if you go back to Daniel chapter 9, this is where our journey begins in further identifying this. The abomination of desolation is mentioned three times in the book of Daniel pertaining to something that would happen in Jerusalem in 70 AD, which of course is about 39 years after Jesus Christ was crucified. And then again, uh, there are some future applications of, as well, which we may not have time to address, but we'll at least reference before we close this section here. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 26 and 27. This is where we see this abomination of desolation very clearly be brought about uh, from the prophet Daniel here. It says here in verse 26 of Daniel 9, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant. This is verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing, notice the, the, the words here, the context clues. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the 
consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. My, my friends, understand verses 26 and 27 of Daniel chapter 9 is written in an A-B, A-B literary format. If you look at the A portion of verse 26, it talks about the Messiah being cut off. This is a reference to the cross. This is a reference to Jesus Christ giving his life on the cross, which was the result of what? His own people mm -hmm. basically saying, crucify him, crucify him, rejecting as a nation of Israel. They rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah, which now the B portion of verse 26 is the result of the rejection of the Messiah, which is, of course, this prince who is to come, which we know to be historically Titus and his Roman armies. They were the uh, result of the rejection of the Messiah by the nation of Israel that would come about in 70 AD. Same thing with verse 26. Seven, uh, it says here, then he, speaking of Christ, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring it into sacrifice and offering. That is again, speaking of the A portion of that text, the cross of Calvary, Jesus bringing it into the sacrificial system and being nailed to a cross and being put to death. But notice it was because of why? Because the nation of Israel rejected him as Messiah. And as a result of that, the B portion now comes. And it says here, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. So what we're reading here and seeing that the abomination that's going to bring about this desolation, there's going to be some type of abomination that will be assigned to the Jews. And this is what Jesus is warning about here in Mark 13 and there in Matthew 24, Luke 21. He's warning the Jews of that time and he's especially telling his disciples to spread the news to the believers that when they see this abomination, then they shall know that it's desolation is near and that armies will surround. This is a sign that they shall flee to the mountains. And history definitely records that. I also encourage you, I don't have enough time to read these, but I encourage you to go read the latter verses of Matthew 21, where Jesus talks about, have you ever read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Matthew 21, also the latter verses of Matthew 23. These are verses where Jesus had told the leadership of Israel. He told them, hey, look, because you've rejected me, I'm now going to uh, take Take this, this, this agreement, this, this Daniel 9 agreement, this, this 70 weeks is coming to an end. Your time is coming to an end. The covenant is going to be confirmed. And in this case, the, the, the fruits of this, of this nation will be taken away from this nation. The royalty and the specialty is going to be taken away from this nation and given it to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. And we know that Jesus, even in uh, Matthew 23, he actually starts in the beginning when he entered the temple. Remember, he says, uh, you have made uh, my... Uh, you have made uh, uh, my house a den of thieves. But then, of course, at the end of verse 38 of Matthew 23, he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is, again, a judgment call. So what is this abomination? Remember the words in Daniel 9, 27, on the wing of abominations. It happens to be that Rome during 70 AD, uh, what was the sign to Jerusalem in 70 AD is that Titus, when he showed up with his Roman armies, they came and they surrounded Jerusalem. You can read this in history. They surrounded Jerusalem just as Jesus told them that it would. And they put their Roman standards in the ground outside of the walls of Jerusalem when they surrounded them. And at the top of those poles, the standard of the eagle, again, on the wing of abominations, the eagle there, uh, they could see it far and wide over the walls and out of they could see that bright gold eagle. Now the eagle represented something. We are told that the official standard of the Roman legions uh, when Jerusalem was surrounded, of course, was the eagle. It was in 63 AD that the standards were deified by the Roman general Pompey. And it was, it was obviously honored uh, in place of the sun god Mithra. In other words, that eagle represented the sun god Mithra. And of course, it was a, it was a god that Pompey adopted during the militia campaign in Asia Minor. So when, uh, when this eagle standard was placed outside of Jerusalem representing the sun god, it was those abominations. It was that abomination of the pagan gods that they were to see. Something is now entering the Holy Land that doesn't belong. This was the sign that when they saw it, they were to flee. And so if you read history correctly, it will tell you very clearly that uh, all of the believers who actually believed in Christ and, and heeded his warning, they were able to escape. Because for a short time, Titus and his Roman armies fled but then they came back. But during the time that they fled, all of the believers that were in Jerusalem, not one single Sabbath keeper lost its life. 
Because again, they fled uh, from that warning that Jesus had given, but many of the people stayed. It was the non-believers that stayed. And of course, more than a million Jews, it is uh, estimated, lost their lives in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. That abomination of desolation, of course, it was national apostasy that led to national ruin. That is the abomination of desolation. And we're gonna see this happen again on a spiritual level in the near future. If I had more time, I would develop that. But there it is in less than 10 minutes. All right, thank you. Gave me 10 minutes now too. All right, my name is Daniel Perrin and I have Wednesday's lesson, The Great Tribulation. And just those words may make you feel a little afraid, raise fears, great tribulation. But I wanna remind you that the text we're about to read, Mark 13 verses 19 to 23, is a divine promise. And God promises us things based out of his love for us and his care for us. So we're gonna see it through those eyes right here. So Mark, not Mark 13, 19 to 23, following up where Ryan just left off. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Here's a different kind of tribulation here to deceive the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. Now, what are those days? Now, certainly it's future, but how far into the future? This is a time of trouble that is greater than anything before and anything, a kind of trouble that's different than anything before or after. Now, both Jesus and the prophet Daniel, as, as he looks prophetically into the future, blended together the prophetic descriptions of what would happen to Jerusalem, along with what God's people would also experience in the future. Now, Jesus here, as he's talking, he mercifully for his disciples, sake, he withholds from them the full prophetic detailed picture of everything God's people would experience because that would have overwhelmed them. That would have been too much. But also what he gives here is just enough so that it's instructive to us and to others who looking from their vantage point in the future can see Jesus already anticipated what we would go through and he, he is making a way for us to go through it. So this promise here would be understood in its right time and give us milestones than to look back and confirm God's words. Now there was immediate tribulation in the Christian era. We know that there was physical persecution, first from the Jews and then from the Gentiles intermittently from pagan Rome. But Jesus uh, had already directed, we saw that in verse 14, directed the minds of people back to the prophet Daniel. And so we're gonna do that as well. We go back to Daniel, especially Daniel 7, where God traces the history of, uh, of what was going on in uh, the area surrounding the Mediterranean of four uh, nations, pictured as beasts and kingdoms. We got uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome, followed by the multiple permanently divided kingdoms in Western Europe, pictured as horns. And then God introduces in vision a new kind of character, a little horn that is not only a political power, but also a religious power. And so this little horn is what for a time was the only broadly visible Christian church. I chose all those words carefully there. This is a, the, the apostate church, though there was true followers of God attending to his word, led by papal leaders and ecclesiastical hierarchy centered there from the city of Rome. And uh, God describes it there in Daniel 7, 25, this little horn power it says, he shall speak pompous words against the most high shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. That's God's Sabbath of his law, the Ten Commandments there. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times 
and half a time. Now that prophetic time period there is equivalent to three and a half years. It's identical to uh, a period called the 1260 days that we see in Revelation 11.3 and Revelation 12.6 and the 42 months that we see in Revelation 11.2 and Revelation 13.5. And so this is a period of 1260 years. Prophetic days equal years that began in 538 AD and came to its conclusion in 1798 AD. And this was a time when the church literally persecuted the saints of God. And this is the time period that Jesus was talking about. And we know that because when we go to the parallel text in Luke 21 verses 22 to 24, it ends with this statement. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles will be for or are fulfilled. So we go then to a connecting verse in Revelation 11 2 that uh, says, leave the outer court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. There's that time of the Gentiles. And so you see the connection here, this time period that Jesus is referring to. And so we're putting those texts together. So this religious persecution of faithful followers of God was intense during the Middle Ages. And if God had not cut that short, literally no flesh would have been saved. It was a physical persecution aimed to physically and literally blot out anybody who was faithful to the words of God through scriptures. And it, it reached its peak when it was completely uninhibited by human power. No oversight, no balance of power, no counter institution, no watchdog groups, no whistleblowers, simply unhindered pursuit of universal agreement by silencing every opposing voice. And this is the reason why that period of time is referred to and called the Dark Ages. So even with the historical records that we have access to, I think we have no idea the kind of darkness that was unleashed against people when they thought no eyes were watching. So Jesus said that there would be a persecution such as never has been and never will be. And it's no wonder the martyrs are symbolically uh, pictured as crying out in Revelation 6 for divine justice. But as promised, uh, God intervened and cut that time period short for the sake of the elect. And he used the Protestant Reformation for that purpose, which made sharing your faith easier because there were regions and rulers that permitted people to share different ideas which resulted in a different kind of persecution or a different kind of, uh, of tribulation. Uh, what that was is not a physical tribulation or persecution, but now a spiritual combat as new ideas, new beliefs, new deceptions are introduced over and over again. And this is why we can read in Daniel 12, 1, where it says there that there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Because now this is not a physical brute force manipulation of persecution, but Satan is still pouring out his, his, his uh, his efforts to deceive and turn people away, but now it's spiritually trying to twist their minds. False prophets are said to arise and false Christs. Now notice it doesn't say that there will be no prophets or ignore all prophets, but there will be false prophets. Joel had already predicted for us in Joel 2, 28 and 29, that there will be a pouring out of prophetic power. And so we should anticipate that God will speak in line with his already revealed word through the mouthpiece of humans who are, who are filled with the Holy Spirit. But there will be false signs and false wonders. People who will claim to have some sort of spiritual enlightenment, that God has given new light and new truth that you're not going to find somewhere else. But if you, if you listen to this, I'm going to uh, put it for you in some sort of new setting. And we see little splinter groups heading away from what God has, has clearly revealed all over the place. Claims of being led by God. And so this is religious people uh, who are using, using scripture, not dividing it rightly, the word of truth, but manipulating it and twisting it. Claims of spiritual leadership. Well, God has opened the door for this because th we, we, these miracles show that God is behind this. 
Miracles do not always show that God is behind it because there is more than one miracle working power out there. Well, God certainly led the way in this because he brought this to us. Well, if it's not in line with God's word and what he has revealed, then it is not of God, even if it is uh, miraculous. And so uh, Satan introduces cunning and camouflage deceptions that, that are all around us. Don't think that they aren't there. And so we are to submit every single emotion, every single idea to God and to his word. Christians at the end time, this is the Laodicean church, need that eye salve from God that gives us the ability to see truth and not simply see teachings of other teachers or things that make us feel good. Jesus says at the end here, it says, I've told you these things beforehand. Now, where did Jesus tell this stuff in beforehand? He revealed it to us in scripture, Genesis straight on through, God has given it to us. And so the elect at this time must be diligent students of scripture. You hear us say that over and over again, it's already appeared on this panel today. We've got to be diligent studies of scripture. Those other books, those other movies, those other things, throw them aside and say, Lord, I'm gonna commit myself to your word in the morning, at noon, in the evening. I'm gonna keep a pocket copy with me. It's gonna be one in my car. I'm going to think it. I'm going to talk it. I'm going to share it with my children. Pay attention to what teachers say. Learn the Bible yourself and then apply the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to anything you hear. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Now I come to Thursday's portion of this study and it's the coming of the Son of Man. And for this part, we go into Mark 13 verses 24 through 32. What are we talking about here? is the question that we're looking at. Beginning in verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So we have here in these verses a message of the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Signs are mentioned. And you already heard some information that is uh, valuable for you and I to study. When you look at the idea or the reality of the second coming, there are over 1,800 biblical references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Over 1,800. That is a lot. The second coming is emphasized in about 17 books of the Old Testament and 23 of the 27 of the New Testament books and they are talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So with these, I, these thoughts in mind, is the second coming important? Yes, it is. So over 50 times, Jesus tells his, his uh, listeners, be ready, watch, be ready. Uh, no one knows the day and the hour. So this idea of looking at these things, looking at the signs is for you and I to be ready to be ready. Now notice that uh, we may not know the day nor the hour, but Jesus made reference that we can know that it is near. We can know that it's at the doors. So these signs are to help us know that the second coming is near. But remember that Jesus says no one knows the day nor the hour. For this reason, I say to you, be warned be alert because there are people trying to calculate the time when Jesus Christ will come. Many have done that in the past and many have failed. And any attempt either today or in the, in the future 
will fail because no one knows the day nor the hour. The Lord has not revealed that at this point in time. So we need to be ready for that time when it happens. Now in Matthew 24, verse 44, Jesus says the following, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such, a such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man comes. So we need to be ready at all times because we don't know the day or the hour. We need to live our lives in anticipation mm -hmm. that the Lord is coming soon. So that, does that mean you stop everything you're doing and uh, just be alert, watching into the skies? The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. I know He is. No, you are to live your life knowing the duties that you have to do, but having in mind that the Lord is coming soon and also to share the good news with others. I read to you from the lesson. The lesson uh, presents something for your consideration. It says, what, however, does Jesus mean by this generation and that day or that hour? These words have troubled many people because obviously the generation to whom Jesus spoke is long dead. So, uh, the author presents this. He says, a simpler solution is to note that in Mark 13, 30, Jesus uses the word this, as in this generation. And in Mark 13, 32, the word that, as in that day and hour, in Mark 13. The word this, uh, he uses the Greek words here, how to or ha, how te, occurs more, uh, more in verses 1 through 13, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem the word that characterizes the latter part of the chapter. Now notice this, he says, thus this generation most likely refers to the first century generation, which saw the destruction of Jerusalem, as Mark 13.30 describes. However, Mark 13.32 refers to the second coming of Christ, which is still future and more distant from the first century. Consequently, Mark 13, 32 uses the word that to speak of events more distant from the first century. I read to you Mark 13, 32 again. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, but only the Father. Jesus in this verse is talking about the second coming. So, Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Beautiful scriptures that we need to keep in mind. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. They're in the grave, sleeping in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. They're what? Asleep. They are asleep. They're not in heaven as some people teach. Some people teach that if you are a believer in Christ and you die, you immediately go up to heaven. But if you were wicked and you die, immediately you go down to hell. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when you die, you're asleep in the grave, waiting for the first resurrection, if you were a believer in the Lord, or if you were wicked, you're waiting for the second resurrection. Now it says in verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the what? A shout. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And trumpets are not silent. And it continues, and the dead in Christ, notice the dead in Christ will rise first. That's a future event. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. We caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So we see and understand that this is going to be an event that is for every eye to see and every ear to hear. And this is why uh, the lesson brings out beautifully that it says the consistent New Testament teaching is that Christ's return is personal, literal, 
visible and audible. The trumpet of God is going to be sounded and everyone will hear it. And the Bible says in Revelation that every eye will see him. Now, there are some powerful instruments to preach the gospel. Powerful, powerful instrument that God has at his disposal. I bring to you the printed page as one. And today we can print literature faster than ever before. I remember being somewhere where they print books and they told me that in less than five minutes they can print a whole Bible. Praise the Lord. Imagine little tracks like the glow tracks that are going from place to place, the great controversy and other wonderful books. Great, powerful instrument in the Lord's hands to preach the gospel. Another powerful instrument is radio. Radio is another powerful instrument to preach the gospel to masses of people, thousands of people or millions of people. Television. 3ABN uses all these, printed page, radio and television to preach the everlasting gospel. Praise the Lord. Another powerful instrument surfaced, I don't know, about 20 years ago. Who would have thought? Internet. About 20 years ago. Now, just about everybody, uh, almost everybody has access to the internet through, through phones, etc. I know there are some places where there are people in jungle and things like that. However, uh, there's even an effort by some individual to put satellites in space so that the whole world has, has access to the internet. But there's another powerful instrument to preach the gospel that I have not yet mentioned, and that powerful instrument is you if you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart because there's no limit to what God can do with anyone that surrenders himself or herself completely to the Lord. Oh, my brothers, thank you so much. This has been a rich lesson, and we're down to our last couple of minutes. I'd like to get a closing thought from each of you. Well, just in relation to the signs of the times, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus wants to remind us that he's got this and he's got us. Amen. I just want to read something from Testimonies from the Church, volume 5, page 464 and 465. It says, The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to speak or to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation and the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. Amen. When you see false prophets arise, you can say, praise the Lord. Jesus saw this coming before and he will see me through. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to get involved in letting other people know that Jesus Christ is coming soon, that he is our savior. And remember Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man is coming. I don't know that I just have to tie this in, but the thought that came to my mind was 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13, where Paul prays and says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love so that, okay, that's a purpose mm -hmm. statement, so that he can establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his angels. As you grow in love, you grow in holiness because love consumes sin. Join us next week for lesson 11, Taken and Tried.